Let's talk about a uh, new thermodynamic quantity, the chemical potential, and also about the Clapeyron equation. So if we think about the free energy of a two-phase system, and for convenience, I'm going to work with gases and liquids in equilibrium with one another, but many of these concepts would apply equally to any two phases in equilibrium. But for the case of a gas and a liquid in equilibrium with one another, the total free energy is simply the free energy of one phase added to the free energy of the other phase. And now, if we ask a question about moving some substance from one phase to another phase, and what is the free energy change associated with that at a constant temperature and pressure, then I can take the differential of the free energy, the full differential, but I'm holding pressure and temperature constant. So I'm going to differentiate with respect to the number of moles in the gas phase and the number of moles in the liquid phase. So I just take the partial derivative with respect to that quantity times the differential of that quantity. So just putting that equation back on this new slide. But I, I do have a phenomenon of mass balance. That is, anything I put into the gas phase had to come out of the liquid phase. They're in equilibrium with one another. So the differential with respect to the gas molecules is the negative of the differential with respect to the liquid molecules. So that means I can replace uh, one of those. I'll replace dN liquid with minus dN gas. And in that case, I end up with this expression for the change in free energy. And I'll move that again onto another slide. And I'll, I'll make a, a definition here. The chemical potential is defined as the change in the free energy with respect to the change in the number of particles at constant pressure and temperature if we're talking about the Gibbs free energy. Right? And so you can also call this a partial molar Gibbs free energy. That takes a little while to say, partial molar Gibbs free energy. Chemical potential, more commonly used phrase. <coughs> so given that, I can now uh, write somewhat more conveniently this expression above as dG equals chemical potential in the gas phase minus chemical potential in the liquid phase times the number of molecules that change the moles in this case, number of moles moving into the gas phase. And so that's a very convenient way to think about phase transfers. At equilibrium, that is the condition where dG equals zero, there is no net movement in either direction. In order for dG to be equal to zero, it's got to be the case that these two chemical potentials are equal to one another. I mean, it could also be that dNG is zero, but as I said, that means nothing is moving. So the condition that nothing is moving is these two are equal to one another. The chemical potentials are the same in the two phases. On the other hand, if the chemical potential is greater in the gas phase than it is in the liquid phase, then in order for dG to be less than zero for a spontaneous process to occur, it will have to be the case that dN of the gas phase molecules is less than zero. That is, they want to leave the gas phase and they want to transfer into the liquid phase. Similarly, if the potential, chemical potential, in the gas phase is lower than that in the liquid phase, then in order for dG to be less than zero, if I look up here, this is less than that, so that will make this quantity negative. I want this to be negative for a spontaneous process. That means this must be positive. That is, we want molecules to be moving into the gas phase. And so the bottom line is that when you're out of equilibrium and spontaneous processes happen, matter flows from a higher chemical potential to a lower chemical potential. And that really explains why it's called a chemical potential. It's the potential to attract matter or to repel matter as you move from higher chemical potentials to lower chemical potentials. So remember that uh, if we think about a pure substance and this phase change going from one phase to another, in that instance, the chemical potential is the change in the free energy with respect to the change in moles. If it's actually zero moles to one mole, that would take you from no free energy because there's nothing to the free energy of one mole of a pure substance. So the chemical potential is just that the free energy of one mole of the pure substance, the molar Gibbs free energy. 
When we're at equilibrium, the chemical potential in any two phases, so I've, I've actually made it completely general here, phase alpha and phase beta, and I'm emphasizing that it's at a given temperature and pressure, we can take total differentials, so differentiate with respect to P at constant temperature, with respect to T at constant pressure for each of the two phases. And since they were equal, these two expansions are equal. And a completely equivalent way to write that is not, in fact, to use chemical potential, but for a pure substance to insert instead the molar free energy. So it's a partial molar free energy here. <coughs> And I'll just transfer that equation uh, over here to work with it a little bit more. And we can rewrite this. What is the partial derivative of the free energy with respect to pressure? It's the volume. What is the partial, free energy, partial derivative of the free energy with respect to temperature? It's the entropy. So I'll replace those terms in this equation with the respective molar volumes and molar entropies for the phases, alpha and beta. So these are different quantities in the different phases. I can now rearrange that. I'll, I'll collect the terms in pressure and the terms in temperature to get dp dt is equal to the difference in entropies between the two phases divided by the difference in molar volumes between the two phases. So that difference in molar entropies, we would call that the transition entropy, delta transition molar entropy. And this is the delta transition molar volume. And then finally, if you uh, look back at video 7.3, you'll recall that the transition entropy is equal to the transition enthalpy divided by temperature. So transition enthalpy is a heat much easier to measure as an experimental quantity. And so that is the Clapeyron equation. So it relates the slope of the coexistence curve and remember, this is a coexistence curve. It tells you how pressure changes with temperature while two phases are in equilibrium. And that's what the coexistence curve is. That it is equal to the transition enthalpy divided by the temperature times the transition volume. And so let's employ that then, the Clapeyron equation, in a short self-assessment. All right, so here's the manipulation of the Clapeyron equation in order to answer that question. And you can pause for a moment here and take a moment to read it. After that, it's time to move on. Next, we're going to look at a variation that's a little bit more useful than the Clapeyron equation in a general way, and in particular, the Clausius Clapeyron equation.